I won't speak for very long. The title of, of my uh, talk is called Adventures in Social Mobility. And this is a topic that if you pick up any newspaper or any magazine or any news article these days, you'll hear the issue of social mobility actually come up in some form, uh, in, in some way. And it is a particularly vexing question in this country, particularly a country that is so obsessed with class structures and class ways of doing things, and the kind of issues that you face as an individual if you don't belong to the right class or you are not born to the right parents at the right time in the right place. And that can often, often uh, exacerbated in many ways by virtue of the fact that if you're a minority or even a visible minority. And so it, it is a, is a, it's a question that is quite vexing on which I have done some work, um, including uh, on the BBC recently. But I'll just touch upon a lot of the themes that are on that topic, and then maybe we can open up some question and answers to discuss some more of it. First, a bit, a bit about me. Uh, I'm uh, obviously Hashi Mohammed, this barrister broadcaster, Tick Tick. Um, but I was born in Kenya to Somali parents many years ago. Uh, I am, if you can believe it, one of 12 children. Uh, I am number eight in that list, so I'm very grateful for my mum for not having stopped after number seven. Uh, and she continued and she always said that, you know, as long as I didn't die in jail or on drugs, she would be happy. So I think she's pretty doubly happy now. Uh, so that is the story of the sort of background from which I'd come from. My father died when I was very, very young. Uh, my family came here as uh, refugees. I came here as a young, unaccompanied child refugee when I was nine, not speaking a word of English and all of the challenges and the difficulties which come with that, as you might uh, all imagine or even uh, comprehend. And that's the kind of context in which I came into the United Kingdom. So you can imagine what it must be like for anybody coming here, not really understanding the culture or uh, the language, but imagine coming here as a nine-year-old boy without your parents trying to make sense of it all in a new culture, a new environment, without any real sense of what's happening. And then growing up in very deprived communities uh, where the poverty of ambition is palpable, where the schools are underperforming, where uh, the disadvantages pile up against you, and then you're obviously growing up as a black man called Hashi Mohammed in modern-day Britain. So I guess in many ways I had the full house of, uh, of disadvantages, and it's quite improbable that I sit here now as this broadcaster. I was very lucky to have gone to Oxford uh, on a full scholarship for my master's, to the bar on a full scholarship, then as a barrister, and then here now. So it, it does seem quite seamless, and it does seem as though that it's been a relatively easy journey, to which I say that there's still plenty of time to fuck this up. <laughs> and so that's the kind of um, place that, 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 that we are now faced with in sense of me trying to understand what all this means and to try and understand how realistic it is for anybody to sort of, you know, go down the path that I have gone down. And this is something I'm interrogating right now in a book that I'm writing and all the themes which come with that. And I just wanted to touch upon those themes uh, with you e e now e in the sense that the journey that has taken place in the last 24, 25 years of my life is one where you're living a life that is completely unrecognizable to the life that I was born in or born into, a life that is completely unrecognizable in relation to the environment in which I grew up in and the environment in which I now work, mix and mingle, uh, communicate, uh, and make a living. Uh, I, I, I speak my mother tongue, Somali. Um, I Hopefully, I'm able to communicate well in English. Uh, and it, it is that kind of intricacy of the many worlds that exist in one's mind and the confidence to be able to reconcile the two and find your place, whatever that place may be, and obviously seek out that purpose and meaning in your existence 
that is something that I'm constantly trying to interrogate that I see a lot of people struggle with, that I struggle with to, to a degree, and which can never really be explained to anyone unless you have fully explained it to yourself first or even experienced it in some shape or form. And so here are just some of the thoughts on this topic. I don't uh, purport to have all of the answers. I don't purport to know all of the truth or even most of it. But what I do know is just a few things that are quite common in that I came as a first generation immigrant. I'm reading a book at the moment by a woman called Afua Hirsch. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of her in a book called Brit-ish in which she talks about uh, the interrogating of identity and belonging and what it means to be British today. And, and she, if you don't know anything about her, has a, 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 a father who, of German Jewish heritage, a mother of Ghanaian heritage. She's a mixed race woman who grew up in Wimbledon, uh, whose parents had struggled a great deal, but she grew up in, in, in Wimbledon, privately educated, went on to Oxford, and is now this amazing journalist. And what Afwa talks about in her book is this sort of difference in generations whereby you have one generation who've come here with nothing and, and who are genuinely trying to make it, whether that be the Indian who uh, is running his shop seven days a week, 12 hours a day, in order to ensure that his children are able to then actually go to university better educated and sacrifice themselves in the sort of planting the, the trees that whose shade you may not one day enjoy, but your children will enjoy and your children's children will be able to enjoy. Or the kind of common immigrant story that you will have heard from a number of people who say, I came here with nothing and, and now my children are this, or the Sadiq Khan story of, of the bus driver's son. You know, you've heard those common stories. And what Afwa talks about is to say, well, okay, they had their journey and they had their struggles, but here I am now as a privately educated uh, Oxford graduate, but I'm struggling with this identity and this question of belonging. And that whilst they may have been focused on opportunity and wealth creation and better uh, circumstances for me, I'm struggling with this idea of why am I here, who am I, how do I reconcile these things in that sense. And so it, it's fascinating because once you encapsulate that in one sentence, it's the sort of, that first generation's struggle to survive and this generation's luxury of trying to understand who they are. And in so many ways, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle that is real and one doesn't diminish the other and one doesn't sort of negate one, uh, the other. But think about that in my own life. I can say to you that I have lived both of those in my own short life, exactly in the same circumstances where Af was talking about her great grandfather, her grandfather, her father, and her, and the stories that she talks about in the intergenerational ways are the stories that I have lived of coming here with impoverished circumstances to then going to these elite institutions and trying to make sense of myself in Britain today simultaneously. What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does it taste like? What does it mean? for the kind of country that we're growing up in? What does it mean for our children? What does it mean for your sense of purpose, drive, determination, and ability to kind of mix and mingle in multiple registers? These are the questions that are often asked, but very difficult to actually um, find ways of, 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 of answering. Then there's the question of multiple identities, where are at a, a British Muslim um, Islam conference here, whereby, you know, if you're, if you are a Muslim in this country, chances are, more often than not, you belong to another minority at the same time because of the way the religion is that you are likely to be of another minority group. And then if you're a woman as well as that, so you, you know, imagine yourself as a black Muslim woman growing up in this country with a foreign name, for example, you can see how the prejudice and the disadvantages might actually pile up. And if you're like me, for example, add another layer of English not being your first language, for example, and growing up in a household where English isn't your first language. So 
you can already see that before you've even done anything and you, before you've even gone anywhere, you're faced with these multiple layers, both within and without. And in a, in a society where you're trying to make something of yourself, both in, some, in circumstances where there, there might be factors that are beyond your control, but also factors that are within your control, but you don't understand what to do with them. There's, so there's that question of faith, there's that question of culture, and there's that question of race. And how they interface with one another is also quite difficult. Then, of course, there's that extra layer that is quite unique in many ways to Britain of class and accents and the kind of education that you had, the kind of mindset you carry, as if matters couldn't be more complicated enough. And then, of course, above all, that meaning, that purpose. Why are you here? What, what are you doing? How do you make sense of it all? What is it? What's the point of this life? And it's always quite amazing for me because I, I, I remember once I was at a court and I turned up, uh, it's an, it was an immigration tribunal, not far from here actually. Uh, I don't do immigration law, but the court was doing civil and immigration matters. And I, was, I bumped into a group of friends, a group of people on the one corner uh, waiting to go into the courtroom. It was a Thursday morning. And one of the guys I recognized because he, was, he goes to the same barber shop as I do. And, and I went over and I said hello, and, and it turns out that he was there with one of his cousins, and they were waiting to go into an immigration tribunal where one of his cousins was about to be deported. And that his, that his mum was there, you could see she was in complete distress. And I went over and I said hello, good morning, I didn't really introduce myself as a barrister or anything like that. And a number of things happened. The mother looked up at me and sort of said, you know, are you here as our translator? And, and it was fascinating because I don't think she'd ever met that Somali barrister before. And it was natural for her to, to assume that I'd be there as a translator and nothing more. But I did not take in any way, shape or form any offense. I just said, oh, no, I'm not, but I'll go find out for you who is. But it was fascinating to see because, you know, in her own mind, you know, she, even in her distressed moment, you know, all she could see was, where's my translator? Because I need to speak to my lawyer and everything. But to her, I didn't amount to anything more than a translator in that moment. And, and it's that level of expectation that we have for each other that is also quite critical. It's, quite one, it's one thing. It's one thing other people who are not within my community not expecting me to amount to something. But if, if we don't expect, and this happens all the time. I was at another, I was at a black tie dinner where I was dressed in my hoodie jacket before I had a black tie on underneath, but I had a hoodie jacket, bright red North Face jacket underneath it all. And I, and I walked in with two colleagues, English colleagues. We had just had a quick bite at a local restaurant before we went to this black tie reception. And I, I said, guys, I'll, I'll walk right up behind you. And I was just texting somebody and there's this massive set of staircases we were going up. And, and they had just gone ahead of me and, and the security guard, a Nigerian guy stops me and says, sorry, so are you in the right place? You know, and I laughed because I don't, again, I, I really don't get offended by these things, but I, I looked at him and then I zipped my jacket down and then it dawned on him. And then I just stepped aside and I, and I finished whatever it was I was doing, texting, and then I said, look, I, and I went up to him afterwards, after the dinner had finished on my way out, I said, you know, he came up to me actually before I left. He said, I'm so sorry for asking you that because you know, that I'm just checking the security. And I said, don't worry about that. I'm not offended at all, but I said, but remember this, if you don't imagine me in a place like this, if you can't see me as equal to any of these people, what hope do we have for progress? What hope do we have to genuinely rise for, to fulfill our real potential? Just think about that, you know? And he was just almost in tears, and I didn't mean to bring him to tears, but he, he understood instantly what I was saying to him. He understood what I was explaining to him, but he wouldn't have thought about that. He wouldn't have thought about that. He's doing his job and the algorithms in his mind connect the dots that somebody like me, who is obviously a minority in a place like this, isn't supposed to be here. And the irony about going back to the story about the courtroom is that I went and found the translator for that woman. I went back to Chambers 
afterwards and a couple of my colleagues came in and, and they said, we're going to Paris tomorrow for the day, for lunch. We're catching the Eurostar at 8.30. Would you like to come along? And it was just amazing to think that this morning, <laughs> I was in court where this woman was thinking I was a translator, and then I'm in a place where now my colleagues go to Paris for lunch for the day, because that's the kind of world that I'm now inhabiting. So the point about this story really is to say that in this question about social mobility and, and, and moving from one point to another, it is as much about hard work determination, focus, and drive as it is about reconciling and really deeply thinking about how you fit into these worlds and being confident in your own skin. Because if you're not confident in your own skin and understanding and not, you'll snap at that woman who is thinking that you're a translator. That security guard, you're gonna have an argument with that security guard. But actually, if you step back and you think, okay, this is the world that I'm living in, where I am such an exception, that I'm, um, I'm even alien to the people who look like me, who have experienced the same things as me. What do I expect of the majority community to think anything else? And so that's what I hope I was trying to pull out as much as I could. And the final thoughts are that a part of this is just understanding human nature. Human nature is a fickle uh, thing, and it's on the surface quite profound, but in reality chaotic and all over the place. And so it is important that we understand and have that humility to really transpose ourselves in other people's shoes to be able to reflect and deeply understand why we are where we are, what we're supposed to be doing where we are, and, and what our purpose and meaning comes, because it's that constant journey. And it's, it's a never-ending journey.